So after a very great year for startups in 2021, we are all out there celebrating, but this time kind of feels like the celebrations were a bit immature because globally there are a lot of signs which are affecting the Indian startup ecosystem. In China, the government's strict lockdown has arrested the growth momentum, which was signs of post-COVID recovery. In India and US, central banks have been hiking the interest rates, which have caused a huge slowdown in the startup and public investments. And of course, on the European side, there's the Ukrainian war that's going on. With that, a lot of sentiments in India has slowed down and we'll be talking more about that. But once again, welcome back to the Startup Operators Weekly Roundup. The Roundup is the show for people who want to stay updated with major developments of the Indian startup ecosystem. If you're new to the podcast, please do subscribe and share it with folks you think will enjoy the show. In this week's podcast, you'll be talking about what the pre-IPO sentiments are for delivery and all the layoffs that has been happening in the Indian startup community. And of course, all the various fundraisers that happened last week. But before we move on to that, Roshan, how has the week been for you? Dude, can you come up with a, a less sadder intro, please, for God's sakes? I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, some of this is uh, is painful news, especially people being let go and everything, uh, for sure. Right. And there is very real reason to be cautious for sure. Right. I mean, markets crashing 25% uh, in a month or so, you know, is definitely worrisome. But at the same time, you know, I think we have to, you know, put it in perspective, uh, I would say. Right. I mean, we have to put things in perspective and really look at the Indian startup ecosystem and how much of that is affected by all of this macro stuff. Right. I mean, I put out a a tweet, I think it was yesterday or so, you know, if you look at the entire VC investments for 2021, the peak bull market, uh, it was about $600 billion. You know, Indian startups did about, raised about $40 billion, right? And that's about 6-7% of the the total money, right? And if you look at VC investments as a proportion to, you know, PE and all of those other asset classes as well, I mean, it's, it's it's significant, but it's not majority, right? So the trickle down, you know, from the Fed raising interest rates to the markets crashing to the VC investments being affected to finally, you know, your seed or series A startup in Kormangla being affected is, is, is quite a stretch, right? So I would say, I mean, yes, there is reason to be cautious, but no reason to panic as yet, right? And especially if you are an early stage startup, because, you know, what you will see is that seed and series A activity will definitely continue, right? I mean, if you look at some of the larger funds, Sequoia has raised $2 billion, Axel has raised $600 million, Prime Ventures uh, raised a new fund, India Quotion raised a new fund, Bloom has raised a new fund, and plenty others that I'm actually missing, right? So all of these folks have raised new funds and they have, you know, just the, the way VCs are structured, they have to deploy it in another two years or, or so, right? At best three years. So where is this amount of money going to go? You know, I mean, it's not like they'll put in fixed deposits, right? So they have to go into startups. You're not going to see the kind of uh, large check sizes, you know, series B of 50 million plus, or you're not going to see those kind of insane value multiples of like, you know, uh, 65X and 40X and 50X on forward revenue and stuff. So those things are not going to be usual, right? I mean, it's not going to happen, but everyone at the back of their heads knew that, you know, 2021 was exceptional, right? I mean, we were living in the peak of the bull market and, you know, I've spoken to, what, uh, 100 founders or so, right, in the last year, year and a half. And uh, every smart founder knew that, you know, there is cash in the market, liquidity is high. So money is available for cheap. I'm going to raise some. But I don't think anyone, I mean, anyone really expected that this will continue forever and forever, right? I mean, all of them, uh, most of them would have had guardrails. Uh, I certainly know that, you know, our founder at Vimo was certainly wary about what's to come, right? We were always prepared for this and most smart founders were. So now to see a lot of Gyan on Twitter, you know, threads on top of threads saying that, you know, oh, startups did this, they're so foolish and this is how it was, that is how it was. Everyone kind of knew it, right? I mean, it's not like people were stupid and naive and all of that. I mean, there is a section of people who are, you know, uh, foolish or there's a section of people who are extremely intelligent in any market, right? But to base the entire 100% of the people as uh, intelligent or experts in a bull market and, you know, call all of them duds or idiots in a beer market is, uh, is missing the point. I don't think that's, uh, that's right. So I would say, you know, a little bit of perspective, people should you know, calm the hell down and just focus on your customers, you know, hunker down and build. That's what I would say. So, yeah. 
So I think we need a more optimistic intro, Gunjan. So that's why I mean I said we should talk about the gloom and doom, but also put it in perspective. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think by the time we get to the end of this roundup, maybe that perspective will change because a couple of items to discuss. But one sector of company which has been really been badly hit are the tech start which planned on going IPO, right? We I think the delivery IPO will be going on soon. And as per May twenty first, their IPO prices had slipped below its listed price in the grey market. And of course, this response in the grey market is due to you know the losses which the company re- reported, the weak cash flows, and also because of the ongoing crisis which the world is facing, especially due to the Ukraine war. There has been a lot of increase in fuel costs, supply chain costs, uh, logistic issues, and even the entire cost of fulfillment has seen a rise. And uh, with the valuation which delivery has been asking for the IP is higher than all their com- competitors combined. So for example, if you combine the market cap of TCI Express, Blue Dart, Gati, VRL Logistics, Mahindra Logistics, that is still total than the market cap of delivery, which is currently at 35,000 crore, right? And on the other side, delivery is not even profitable, whereas the other companies are. So w- what, what do you make of this? It's a tough time, man. I mean, there's a lot of uh, unpredictability in the markets right now, uh, right? And the geopolitical situation, the macro situation could not be worse. So it's pretty rough uh, time to IPO and I, and I feel bad for delivery, you know, that they couldn't get the timing right. I do believe that it's fundamentally an innovative business and also a business that can actually generate profits, right? Because if you look at it, I mean, they're pretty asset light uh, and they're technology led, right? Technology means it can be scalable as well. So it is fundamentally an innovative business, I feel. At this point of time, I think the markets are punishing them for a bunch of uh, reasons also related to the business itself uh, at this stage, right? Which is that they have negative cash flows, uh, they have significant debt, probably 300 million or so. And most of uh, the costs, I believe, are going towards paying for freight. And at this point, I think they're probably spending 1.18 for 1.18 rupees for every one rupee they earn. And if you look at them in contrast, as you mentioned, to some of their competitors, right? Whether it's Blue Dart or whoever else. Now, these are traditional businesses and they've been profitable for years, right? But also logistics is a very low margin business, you know, and a bunch of these factors combined, uh, I think is uh, causing delivery shares to trade at a five rupees discount uh, in the gray market. Now, the gray market, again, is very interesting. It's pre-IPO and these uh, shares are traded on trust, basically. I mean, it's all cash transactions. There are no literal shares being transferred, but it is basically to sense if there is enough demand for the script, right? Basically, the other factor that could also be influencing the delivery IPO adversely is the fact that, you know, e-commerce folks are also spinning off their own uh, uh, logistics arms as businesses of their own, right? I mean, if you look at, uh, we, we discussed eCart last roundup, I think, right? Or Flipkart, which is also offering its services to, you know, merchants and whoever else uh, outside of Flipkart as well. Uh, and you're going to see that kind of play out across some of these larger startups, I would say, larger, more mature startups, because again, they have pressure to generate uh, cash flows from other streams of business. They have pressure to, you know, be profitable at a unit economic level and so on. Uh, so, so they're going to spin off uh, these entities as well. So I would say it's bad timing and uh, post the whole Paytm listing, right? I mean, the, the markets have been solid, right? And it's it's going to stay this way for a while. Uh, it's going to take some time for, you know, tech investors uh, uh, to really trust, uh, rather for investors to really trust the tech stocks as such. Forget about tech stocks, any stock at this point of time, right? I mean, you look at LIC, it was already down, I think, down to around 820 levels, right? Uh, from an IPO price of 900 or so. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty rough time IPO wise, I would say. Yep. But also talking on, right, uh, when we started off this year, right, this the one term which is really buzzing a lot in Twitter was the whole, the great resignation, right? People were leaving startups, the lockdown shut and like, things were getting back to normal. And come almost June, the entire situation has flipped. We are seeing startups ha- having to lay off employees because either they're running short of uh, funds or there's not enough cash flow. Two companies laid off a sizable chunk of their uh, workforce, which included Cars24. They laid off 600 employees or about 7% of its workforce. And M-Fine, which is run by Novocura Tech Health Services, who that laid off over 500 employees amid this funding crunch. And uh, in M-Fine, employees were told that the startup is short on funds to release salaries for the coming months. 
but with these two companies right they joined the likes of well funded startups such as vedantu and academy and misho to lay off hundreds of employees just because of the fact that investments have been drying up is there any connection between these two phenomena that we are seeing the great resignation to lay off not the great resignation as such but look it's a, it's a cycle right i mean you raise money at an insane value multiple and then you have to justify that and so you have to change all of your growth numbers to kind of meet that valuation right so if uh, let's say i mean you were going to grow at 2x i mean now you have to do 3x or 4x or let's say i mean if you were supposed to hit a number by 2025 you have to hit that number by 2023 or 2024 right now how is that going to happen that's going to happen by you know artificially sort of pumping uh, steroids into the system right which means that more people more money more resources and more of everything right and when funding dries up then you have to really recalculate everything right i mean you have to look at your zero cash state and you have to do what's right by the business i also feel that the more mature startups and more mature entrepreneurs really have a more even keeled approach to this uh right but it is what it is i mean it's a it's a pretty difficult time i just hope that the people who are being let go are assisted supported in every way possible i see that a lot of startups have come forward to openly say that hey i mean if you've been let go uh, at so and so place i mean we're happy to consider you for positions internally uh, which is good right i mean the startup ecosystem coming together also i mean i feel it's a great time to hire people right because i feel like in you know for a year or so i mean the salaries and the job market had, had gone way out of whack i mean it was never going to be sustainable at that level right i mean i interview plenty of people and uh, the one thing i keep telling candidates is look don't price yourself out of the market right i mean you have to work for another 30 years of your life and uh, it's good to make the best of whatever market situation is and get a bump up on your salary and all of that but don't price yourself out of the market right i do believe that some sanity is returning on that front uh, i do believe that you know if you're a founder uh, now's a great time to hire people you know especially mid to senior people now's a great time to hire people because uh, you know for circumstances uh, if they're looking out you could uh, you could definitely attract some great talent at reasonable costs uh i would say right so so the, there is two sides of the same coin i would say it's pretty unfortunate i do hope that it's a soft landing for you know the people who've been let go by the way i mean we are definitely hiring for our team at vimo uh, multiple roles across functions uh so if you guys uh, are interested i mean do reach out to me or gunjan or you know hit me up on twitter etc twitter linkedin uh we're, we're happy to connect you with the uh, relevant roles and positions Yep. All right. Let's move on to some funding news. It wasn't that there was absolutely no fundraisers happened last week. Fashion Isa has raised hundred million dollars in its Series B round of funding, which was led by Process Ventures and Westbridge Capital. Now they'll be using these funds to create a sustainable supply chain for the global fashion industry to fuel its expansion. They offer fashion brands end-to-end -end apparel manufacturing solutions. now it will also monetize its uh, fintech offerings expand its raw material procurement offer supply chain financing to sme apparel manufacturers and create a net positive supply chain by 2030 now that's a very lofty goal but digitizing the entire fashion supply chain and its distribution that sounds like sounds like a great idea what do you make of that yeah fashion is a uh, seems like pretty interesting business uh, right i mean there are plenty of other businesses of this sort uh, that kind of resemble a zetwork or a zilingo in different uh, domains right where they're using tech and basically platform and financing and plenty of these other things to bring various stakeholders in the ecosystem together uh, and streamlining processes making discovery easier making uh, you know transactions smoother and so on and so forth so it's you know b2b b2b commerce uh, really took off in 2020 2021 right we've had uh, you know bizongo we've had zetwork we've had off business uh, and so on uh, on the podcast and uh, it's really fundamental innovation i think we should definitely do a deep dive on fashions uh, uh, for sure right and i'm especially excited about people solving at the manufacturing end of things you know because if you look at fdi we recorded the highest fdi inflows uh, for the year right i mean something like 83 billion dollars or something uh, and of course i mean a lot of it significantly was software related but the manufacturing sector is also picking up right some of the policies whether it's you know pli atmanirbhar bharat or uh, you know some of the subsidies and so on and so forth 
in each of these individual sectors, uh, whether it's EV, electronics, and so on, right? I mean, it's uh, it's definitely helping. We've often talked about how you know India just leapfrogged to services, and we didn't really have the whole manufacturing revolution, right? I do believe that's long pending, and this year we will get there with this kind of innovation, right? With the kind of innovation that these B two B commerce uh, startups are pioneering. Yeah, so it's very interesting. And it's a hundred million dollar Series B, by the way. I mean, I think I have to, <laughs> I have to eat my words. I just said that there won't be fifty million plus checks, right? <laughs> yeah, and uh, I was just reading about it, and it was started in twenty twenty, and it's already in Series B stage in two years with a wow, hundred million amazing. dollar check. Pretty amazing. Uh, so one K Kirana, which is uh, another Indian startup that kind of makes a uh, hyper local shopping more convenient and retail distribution more efficient. Uh, they raised twenty five million dollars in a new financing round. Uh, this three year old company Series B financing was led by Alpha Wave Global, Info Edge Ventures, and K Capital. Now, One K Kirana Bazaar, as mentioned, organizes the urban retail ecosystem by aggregating Kiranas and help them meet consumer aspirations and also help consumers and themselves save money. We must give it off to them, like with all the investments we have seen with Future Group, Reliance, Amazon, Flipkart eating into their space these small uh, local shops have survived right but the biggest challenge for them is that you know you know the profit margins are in the low single digits so and companies like 1k kirana and the other indian startups which we have talked in the past roundups are actually trying to bring an orbit shift in this space what's your thought on that yeah, retail is a hard, hard business, right? I mean, uh, as you mentioned, the profit margins are razor thin and you have the giants in retail, right? Whether it's Tata, Reliance, Adani and so on, right? And uh, the way to make money in retail is to have vertically integrated brands, right? I mean, it's to have cell phone brands, basically. Uh, in fact, I mean, Reliance uh, has, <laughs> you know, launched all kinds of brands, right? I mean, they have their own variant of Maggie called Snack Tight, I think. Very, very similar. I mean, you would definitely mistake it for your regular Maggie, right? But they're also acquiring a bunch. They're also acquiring a bunch of these small brands and businesses and so on just to add to their PNL, right? And so the, the Kirana Wala, I mean, is going to, my hypothesis is that, you know, the Kiranas will stay for now and for the future oncoming, right? Because I think they're just so integral to how we purchase and not just purchase. I mean, last mile in India is definitely going to be a challenge, uh, even for the biggest of people, right? And I feel that, you know, all of these brands will have an integrated strategy in a way that, you know, they will they will figure how they can adopt these Kiranas in their functioning rather than, you know, compete with Kiranas, right? Because one thing COVID showed us, you know, over the last two, two and a half years is that your neighborhood Kirana still knew what to stock, right? I mean, they really had the supplies that you wanted. And now that is a skill that comes with wisdom, right? And wisdom comes from experience. And that is something that you can't buy away with money and you can't innovate away those kind of things, right? I mean, so I do feel that the larger retailers will somehow adopt these Kiranas in some way of fashion. Kirana Bazaar seems, uh, you know, seems pretty interesting, right? I mean, they're helping the little guy in that sense. So they're offering like an entire software back into these Kiranas. They're offering a POS solution and all of those things, uh, basically helping them upgrade on tech. For on the customer side, I mean, they're helping, you know, customers leverage the cheapest prices, the most comprehensive uh, shopping range and so on and so forth. So I think it's it's a very interesting uh, sort of a, a business, you know, and uh, uh, at the at the same end, I mean, at the same time, I mean, I think brands as well have more uh, opportunity in terms of stocking their products in each of these Kiranas, right? Now, again, you know, if you're an HUL or if you're a Marico or whoever else, you have your distribution already laid out for you, right? But if you are, I don't know, a little known brand, right? How are you going to get your, you know, product in, in the hands of different people far, far away from, you know, where you started, right? So it is innovation like this, which is going to help uh, your product reach the hands of the consumer ultimately, right? So yeah, it's uh, it seems uh, very, very interesting. So I think it was uh, Elastic Run, right? That we discussed, uh, you know, a few months back, probably last year, I think, right? Which does something similar. So yeah, I mean, um, the other thing is also estimating all of your supply demand and all of those things, right? So these folks are running some fancy algorithms to give a sense on that, uh, you know, for, for all of these uh, different stakeholders. Yeah. Right. You know, also, I think apps like this would be hugely beneficial for all the various, uh, you know, food companies that we saw in, in India's Shark Tank, right? For them to reach out to more customers, to reach out to like more Kirana store owners for distribution. I think this will be hugely beneficial for them. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, see, if you look at D2C, right, D2C is extremely internet based and uh, the offline market is still way, way bigger than the internet market, right, even post COVID. Uh, and also, I mean, why limit yourself to just one platform, one channel, right? You should try to attract 100% of the customers and be where the customer is, right? So these kind of uh, distribution networks and this kind of innovation really helps uh, uh, the D2C folks as well get their hand, get their products in the hands of as many people as possible. So uh, overall, I think it's a fantastic net positive. Yep, absolutely. And uh, apart from these two startups, Warehouse Robotics and Automation's company, Grey Orange, they raised a $110 million check from Peter Thiel's Mitchell Capital, as well as other existing and new investors. It also received a separate debt fu- financing from funds and accounts managed by the investment firm BlackRock. Melora, which is a Bangalore-based jewelry startup, announced the first close of a $16 million Series D round from Axis Growth Avenue's AIF1, SRF family office, N plus one and existing investors. Melora's valuation doubled in just six months since the last funding round in October when it reached $24 million. But uh, it's also a good time to invest in a, a startup that it's in the jewelry space considering how gold prices are increasing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, Grey Orange is a fantastic story, man. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those startups I've followed for a while. Uh, they started, I think, in 2012, 2013. It's been almost 10 years. And, uh, you know, 10 years back, there were easier problems to solve. Let me tell you that, right? To start a robotics startup, forget about robotics, to start a hardware startup at that point of time. And also at a point when, you know, standards hadn't really evolved, right? Literally every customer that you're talking to has a separate set of protocols, separate set of software, probably custom built, all of that. You know, serving that kind of market is hard, hard, hard work, right? Uh, so props to the founders. I think both of them are Bitspilani folks that uh, started this as an extension of uh, their robotics club in college and so on. I, I, on a side note, you know, all these robotics club, the aviation club, so on and so forth, right? I mean, in these colleges are are just uh, fantastic uh, seeding grounds for such kind of ideas, right? And uh, I hope that, you know, investors are watching closely uh, and they invest some of these uh, ideas and like, you know, uh, so they can, I, I think they do already. I think most of the IITs already offer seed funding for of some kind for startups right out of college, right? So yeah, I, um, I think yeah. Pixel was also uh, started off in college. India's Hyperloop One a team that also was started in college, right? So yeah. Yeah, so fulfillment is a very unsexy space, right? It's not your front end like e-commerce or something of that sort. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, it's become natural now with the, you know, the kind of, Teslas and the Amazons and so on, that robotics is an integral part of manufacturing and supply chain and uh, all of these things. But yeah, I mean, it wasn't at that time, right? And uh, so these guys have built a fantastic uh, product and also software, you know, I mean, it's, it's not just the not just the robots uh, during the supply chain and so on, but it's also the software platform, which is work with other providers and so on, right? So platform agnostic and stuff. So yeah, phenomenal stuff. Companies across uh, US, Europe, Asia, I think this is one of those startups that we'll be hearing about for a long, long while, you know, and especially, you know, whatever has happened post COVID where, you know, human intervention, human touch is sort of minimal, right? Uh, so these kind of things will just gain in prominence. On that note, you know, I mean, I've watched Elon Musk on All In Pod uh, podcast, right? With Chama, Jason and so on. Uh, that's a fantastic podcast, by the way. I mean, I, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. It's It's amazing. The episode with Elon was really good. And he talks about how Tesla could be like, you know, 10 or 12 different companies, you know, by itself, uh, because they're doing everything in a vertically integrated fashion, batteries and even the manufacturing facilities and the robotics and the AI and everything and the software and all of it. I do believe some of that will play off uh, for the EV startups, for instance, right? Yeah, which which are building everything from bikes to batteries at this point. So maybe who knows, you know, I mean, um, five years down the line or maybe seven, eight years down the line, and Ether will spin off uh, two or three of its entities, right? Because they're having to build everything full stack. So, yeah, sorry. I mean, robotics uh, kind of spun me off on that tangent. <laughs> All right. Roshan, in your opening comments, you mentioned, right, that this is such a great time to continue hiring great people and attract great talent. And just on that note, for this week's Talk of Town, we're taking up the tweet by Shashank Kumar, who is the co-founder of Razorpay. And uh, he tweets that in the early days of a startup, don't try to hire rock stars. Instead, hire and bet on people who will grow and become rock stars along with you. And I'm sure that you have your own experiences on this. 
Yeah, so this has been my experience as well. I think in the zero to one journey, I think you should definitely bet on generalists, smart generalists, because plenty of things are still a variable, right? At this point of time, you don't know what channels, what kind of approaches, frameworks, nothing. I mean, you have really nothing at that point of time. Uh, so you need people with a great attitude who are kind of willing to iterate along with you very closely. And I have found that, I mean, if you hire experts at the beginning, if you hire those people who have like, you know, four or five years or maybe 10 years of experience at that point, it kind of acts as a baggage because they want to come and implement those things that have worked for them at that startup that they were working for earlier, where they were rock stars, right? I mean, you have to understand that they haven't been rock stars at your place just yet, right? And so you'll have to do a lot of first principles thinking. So getting those people with a lot of baggage might be difficult. They will be less keen to iterate on a lot of these things and you will have to start like fitting your problems through their solutions rather than you know the other way around so yeah definitely bet on smart generalists and definitely bet on people who are willing to work hard learn your context iterate and and get to the source of truth because that's really what you want at that point you know in the 1 to 10 or 10 to 100 journey you know you might want to bring in subject matter experts you know you want to bring in that rock star who has done X, Y, or Z has seen that kind of scale so that at that point of time, your base is covered. I mean, you know, the first version of something, maybe the second version of something, and these folks will have had experience uh, of, you know, scaling it beyond that. And they can then, you know, tell you, teach you all of the secrets required to scale it beyond where you are at this point, right? So, so yeah, I mean, Shashank has built a fabulous team at Razorpay and, you know, one of the best brands in the country. So I'm, you know, I couldn't agree more with what he's saying. So yeah, all these qu qualities that you spoke about, these are like such innate qualities, which you might not just get to know over a period of two or three interview rounds. So what advice would you have for people uh, who want to hire such people in their teams? So you should hire for strong intrinsics, right? And what are these intrinsics? These are things that make a person what they are simply because they've been a particular way for 24, 25 years of their life, right? Uh, and these intrinsics are hard to change, really, really hard to change, really hard to develop as well. It is what they are. There are a lot of teachable skills, but there are some intrinsics that you can't teach, right? For example, high ownership, high agency, that kida to sort of want to do more, a bit of an optimistic or an enthusiastic approach to life itself. Now, these are things that you cannot teach people, right? I mean, I've tried and failed. At least I haven't been able to do that. So you have to look out for those intrinsics, I would say, in all of your interviews and so on. Uh, and then screen for the rest of the things, right? I mean, do they have a sense of, you know, the, the product and the market that you operate in and so on and so forth. But those things, I would say, are secondary. Uh, but the first thing is you should have pretty strong intrinsics. Because as I said, the zero to one is all about putting your head down, uh, executing, iterating, learning, getting smacked in your face a lot, right? <laughs> because uh, you're not really sure, you know what to do and you're failing most of the times you're you're failing than succeeding right i mean that zero to one uh, so you need people like that uh, so that you know they kind of give that energy to you and you're able to iterate further based on that also awesome so before we wrap up the roundup uh, let's talk about some of the conversations which are scheduled for this week i believe you'll be talking to akash from cash free and with jivraj about podcasting and we had jivraj uh, in the roundup earlier yeah, interesting conversation. Jivraj uh, runs the Indian Silicon Valley podcast, uh, as you guys must know. And uh, he has met the 100 episode uh, milestone, right? Which is pretty huge, I think, you know. And uh, there are a lot of statistics on how many podcasts start and how many actually make it past the 10th episode. And I think it's less than 5% or something make it past the 10th episode, right? And it's even lesser when it goes past, you know, 15 or 20 or 50 or whatever, right? So to make it to episode 100 is a huge milestone. And and he's had some stellar guests on the podcast as well. So, I mean, I'm going to be having a freewheeling chat with him uh, where we're going to discuss plenty of nuances around podcasting, uh, some of the research, the content, the production, the distribution, and, and those aspects. Uh, I also think that this could be beneficial for people who want to podcast, who want to learn more uh, about podcasting because i do believe that literally everyone should start a podcast because everyone has a perspective and the world could do with more unique perspectives so i'm actually excited to talk to akash uh, because i think cash free is a pretty interesting business uh, they were founded in uh, 2015 or 2016 and the whole payments landscape right i mean it's uh, it's evolving in a pretty fascinating way i would say right i mean it's no longer enough to be able to 
uh, send payments, collect payments and so on. I mean, you, it's about what else can you do, right? Because that transaction fees or whatever is, is going down to zero for sure. And you've seen how UPI is gaining market share. So all of these folks have had to adapt. They've had to add tech services, platform, banking services, lending, etc. to their business. And they're doing phenomenally well. Cash free is one of those rare fintech businesses that's actually profitable. <laughs> so I'm actually really interested in uh, understanding how they run the business, how they think about fintech itself and also some of the regulatory aspects, right? I mean, uh, the fintech regulation in India has been really proactive. So yeah, all of those things uh, would be really interesting. So folks, if you have any questions for the guests we'll have on the podcast, don't forget to uh, tweet or message or email to us. Our handles are at Operator Startup on Twitter and the Startup Operator on LinkedIn. You can find our website link and email IDs and our various social media pages in the description below. And if you like all of these uh, news, insights and updates to be delivered straight into your WhatsApp inbox, do click the link in the description. And yeah, with that, let us know what you want us to talk about in the next roundup on Sunday.